Praise God. When Donald said what he did about stealing my thunder, I said, I don't know if I have any thunder to, <laughs> to steal, but the Lord is so good. And I believe he wants us to be awake and aware as his people, and not just sleep on, sleep through the, the night that's gathering around us. You know, Paul said we're not of those who, you know, are drunk and sleep and all that sort of stuff. We are, we are those who have light in the world, and God wants us to be the light of the world. You know, when Jesus came into the world to live and walk as a man, he came into a world that was in gross darkness, didn't he? Uh, even God's people were just having to wait and, and look to him and believe him, but there was just no light. You go to Jerusalem, you go to the temple, there was no light. It was a dark world. And Jesus came and began to minister and began to, to uh, express the life of God that was living in him, didn't he? That's, that was his message. It wasn't a different doctrine so much as it was simply the Father dwelling in him. The light, the life that was in him was the light of men, wasn't it? And his message was to call people out of darkness into his light. And it was an uncompromising message. You know, we have a very murky appearing situation in this country. And, uh, you know, we almost think of some people as sinners, and then there's bad sinners, and there's ordinary sinners, and then there's church-going people. And, you know, we kind of put people in various categories, but boy, I'll tell you what, there's only two categories of people. One day there's going to be a judgment, and there are only two destinations. There's only two ways at that time, and I'll tell you, it's a, it is an uncompromising message, and I pray that God will raise up in our own midst and everywhere he has people an army of those who absolutely live uncompromisingly for the gospel who show forth the life of Christ because there are hurting people. And in this darkness, God is going to have a harvest of people that, are call, that come to him because of the distress that they feel. He's going to create that hunger. How many of you took note the other night when we listened, and I hope others will be able to listen to this as you have opportunity, uh, to the testimony of those two Iranian ladies. And the, uh, the testimony was that because of the the spiritual death, the, the oppressiveness of their, their society, that there was a desperation, there was a hunger, there was an openness to the gospel, that they could go around and talk to people about Jesus and, and people didn't, didn't react to that. They were hungry for that. I've heard a testimony, another testimony, that, uh, where a man who has a television ministry, I believe, or at least a radio ministry that reaches into Iran and he interacts with people. And his testimony is that things have changed. That whereas he used to get skeptical resistance and all kinds of stuff, now it's just openness. How can I know? What, you know? How can I come to Christ? And, you know, God has a way of bringing people to a place of, of need. And boy, we need to be in that place to help them. But, that, but I'm going to come back to this thought that there's only two ways. There's only two sources of life. And we either have Adam's life or we have Christ's. And folks, we need, we need the Lord to help us to, to, to see the difference and to understand. It's, a, it's such a glorious, incredible thing that God has done for us who know him. But we live in a world that is completely, completely blinded and does not understand the life of God. And uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to launch out here, uh, pray that God will direct my thoughts into what he has. Uh, I don't, this is a, certainly an occasion where I do not have the icicles running up and down my spine, and I'm just having to move by faith. So uh, I'll say, as I've said in times past, if this is really not going anywhere and there's no life in it, please somebody say so have the grace to do it, because we want him. Man, you do not need to hear my mouth moving. You do not hear, need to hear my ideas. We need to hear him. He's the only one that has anything worth giving to us. And I want to turn to a different, I mean, to a, not a different passage, a passage we've used many times in Revelation 12. 
But, you know, always there's a slightly different focus when God takes hold of a, of a scripture. There's, there's something on his heart that is a matter of focus. And, and I, I've, I see something slightly different, or at least an emphasis is slightly different. But you know, the, the book of Revelation is full of spiritual truth that is pictured in, in symbolic language. And I surely would not stand here and, be, and try to convey to you that I have the key and I can unlock every mystery in the book of Revelation. That certainly wouldn't be the truth. But I believe that God can give us pictures of truth that are really relevant to us. And that's what he's doing here. He says, a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Now, I think if you, uh, you see this in the context of Scripture, you will see that God had a purpose in raising up Abraham and raising up Abraham's children and through them a nation. His purpose was not to bless a natural people. It, his purpose was to bring forth a Savior who would save not only those among Israel who loved God and who served him, but also the whole world. That was the blessing of Abraham, and we here today are heirs of that blessing. Thank God. If you're in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The promise came through the Lord Jesus. So, well, what he's picturing here is the, the people of Israel, the remnant, the true remnant that actually knew him among the people. Nation as a whole was a, was a nation of unbelievers. They, were, they walked in darkness, but there was a true remnant. And through them, God was going to bring forth a Savior. And so this was the point in time where she was not only pregnant, but ready to give birth. But then it says, then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon. Now it tells us, you know, before it's over, who this is. Of course, that's the devil. With seven heads and ten horns, his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Now, what's he picturing there? He's, he's looking back into history. And he's seeing that not only did the devil rebel against God and say, you know, as we read in uh, Isaiah, you know, I will be like the Most High, that kind of that spirit of self-independence, rebelliousness. He not only was a, did that himself, but he literally deceived and led astray a third of the angels who fell with him. And so that is the kingdom of darkness that now rules over lost mankind in this planet. But anyway, the devil stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. I'll tell you, the devil doesn't miss a trick trying to uh, oppose the work of God. The way this plays out uh, is a glorious picture of the fact that no matter what the devil does, he cannot stop what God is doing. Thank God to, that we have the privilege who know him and have surrendered to him to be on the winning side, to be a part of a purpose that is forever. Thank God. Praise God. Anyway, so anyway, he did that. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter, and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. So, of course, this is compressing all of this in a, uh, in a rather short period of time, but regardless, we see the picture of, what, of God fulfilling his purpose in sending his son to the, to the world, and the devil could not stop any part of that purpose, and when it was over, he was, brought, he was caught out of this world, and he was set on a throne. A throne is what? It's a picture of authority, isn't it? It's a picture of rule. And the prophecy was that he would rule over all the nations. Well, he's been doing it. Even though we see the, the confusion and the darkness of this world, there is a power that is over that, allowing things to unfold, but nonetheless absolutely got Satan on a leash. He cannot do one thing that the devil, I mean, that the Lord does not allow and that does not have a purpose where it affects his people. Thank God. And her child was snatched up to God into his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. I won't try to get into all of that. And there was war in heaven. Michael 
and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But, oh, what a wonderful but that is. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So there was something very, very decisive that happened. God is not looking for you and me to somehow rise up and beat the devil. He's already beaten him. This is a battle that was fought in history and what we need to be is informed about it and to, to, to really to join his side, to hear the call of, of, the, of the holy calling. You know, we sang about it in the song. I'm captured by his holy calling. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about calling people into a kingdom that is absolutely not of this world. It will never be of this world. Jesus, I know a lot of people don't agree with me on this, and that's all right. Jesus is never coming back to establish a political and military kingdom in this world. His kingdom is not of this world. He is laboring successfully to call his people out of darkness into this kingdom that he has established as a result of this victory that was won. It's history, folks. We have every reason this morning to, re to do exactly what he says. On the heels of this, he says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven. This is not a timid voice, is it? This is one that can speak forth with great confidence. You know, we need to have confidence in God. We don't need to, to act like, maybe it's so, maybe it's not, I don't feel it. You know, we need to be able to say it decisively. This, the victory was won. Absolutely, victory was won. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. Thank God. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. And that's more the part of it that my, my mind has been drawn to of late is, is the fact that there are two realms, there are two kingdoms, and that's what Jesus portrayed. Jesus did not give hope to the religious. Did you know that? He spoke to the religious people and said, the, the prostitutes and the drunkards and the murderers, they'll go into heaven before you. But Jesus gave a, 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 a sure word of hope to people that would turn their hearts to him. There is a kingdom that is real. And that's what, that's what we need to see in this. This is not just uh, the heavens is someplace up there. He's talking about two realms. He's talking about the realm of the kingdom of God, a very real spiritual kingdom. Now, yes, it's there, but I'll tell you, it exists here. You know, we were singing about this being his house. I'll tell you, if you have a people here that love him, that serve him, that are in contact, in touch with his kingdom, that are expressions of his kingdom, his kingdom is here. His kingdom dwells in the midst of, of this world. Jesus said uh, to, the, to the Pharisees, he said, uh, don't say the kingdom of God, you know, low here or low there. Men is not gonna, they're not going to say that. They're not going to be able to point to some place and say, well, there's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is among you. Most people are blind to, that, to the reality of that, but God's kingdom is here, and it's right here. And what God is looking for from us is, is a greater and greater expression of that. And he has absolutely laid the foundation for that to be the case. But so here you have the heavens and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. Well, I'll tell you, if his time was short, he knew his time was short as soon as the cross happened and the resurrection. What do you think he thinks now? Oh, my God. Which realm are you in? 
Which kingdom are you in? That's a sobering word. It's a glorious, awesome thing for anybody who is in the kingdom of God. But for anybody who's clinging to their own life, that's what it comes down to. You look at how the devil is overcome, how, that, how this plays out in the lives of those who are part of this kingdom of heaven. How does it play out? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Well, I didn't shed that. The blood of the lamb is not something that represents anything that I did. Thank God. Why do we think that in order to attain this kingdom, we've got to do something? Jesus has paid it all. Thank God. That's how I overcome him, not, be, not by relying on anything that I do. And that's what happens with the religious. They're going to they're gonna come up with something. They're going to come up with some way, some self worked up righteousness and they're going to come and try to present that to God and say, God, you should accept me. Oh God, what a farce, what a deception. I'll tell you, the people who enter this kingdom come down to a place where they know there is nothing, nothing that they can present to God that he will find acceptable. We are completely corrupted by this awful thing called sin. There is but one answer to sin. It's the blood of Christ. Praise God for the gospel that, that, that reveals to us a righteousness that comes from God himself. And the sinner that puts themselves at his feet and just comes and says, Oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That blood has the power to blot out those sins as if they'd never happened. Oh, and then the heart is prepared as a place to be a temple of the Holy Ghost then God can come in and live and impart a totally different life. Oh, thank God. That's the difference between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God's Son. There's two different sources of life that's going on. Well, you can put a robe of religion on Adam, but it doesn't make him a Christian. It doesn't make him a servant of God. But they, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, but the word of their testimony, as we said so many times, that's when God's word has such a place in our lives that there's a conviction. It's real. We're not just spouting words and formulas. You know, we, sometimes we'll, ha we'll have people write into us and, you know, pray for wisdom. God knows. There's people who write in that are hurting. And some of them are, you know, just by the description, they're full of devils and they know it. And they're tormented and they just can't seem to find the answer. And they're looking for one of two things. They're looking for somebody with magic hands who can just sort of drive the devils out of their life. Or they're looking for a formula. Give me the magic procedure. Give me the magic words that I can quote to the devil and he'll go. Oh my, we need the reality of Christ inside of a life. There's a lot of people who would love to get rid of their devils so they can be free of the effects of that. And then they can be free to live their own lives. That doesn't happen. We need Jesus on the inside. We need him to, to be Lord of our lives. We need his life. There's no other answer. But the, the, what he's talking about here, the word of their testimony, if something is a testimony, it's an expression of what I really am, the true conviction of my heart. How did I get such a heart as that? How is, that, how is such a thing possible? I mean, the word tells us the heart is deceitful above all things desperately wicked who can know it so here's something coming out of a heart that is different from that wickedness there is a confession of the word of God there's something we can say that the devil has no answer for how is such a thing possible God has to give us a brand new heart that's part of the gospel. God comes in and there's a, there's a real change that happens down here. I tell you, you leave that change out and you try, to, you try to cover it over with religious effort. You have nothing but self-deception. Oh my, there's so many people in this, in this uh, country of ours especially who have deceived themselves in this area. But look at the other 
aspect of this. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Because this, uh, this is where it comes from. As I said, we, this is where it gets to. We, are, we either have Adam's life, and that's what drives us. That's what motivates us. That's what we go by. That's what uh, characterizes our lives. Or we have the life of Christ himself in us. There is no other way. And the people that live in this realm called the heavenlies, they have died. And they have given their hearts to him. And their lives to him. Let's just look at something that uh, we've seen many times before. Uh, praise God. Ephesians chapter 2. It's a very familiar scripture. Because this is looking at believers. These are people who have now come to Christ. God has performed the miracle in their lives. But now Paul is, is taking them back to show them what has happened in their lives. As, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Well, that's a pretty desperate situation. That's the world, folks. And you have so many people that will come to a place of need. Sometimes they grow up in the church, sometimes not. And they come to a place, they realize they got needs. They, they're, they're convicted enough that, yes, there's a judgment to come. Yes, I better do something about it. But what never seems to happen is that they never die. They never really give up their life. And what they call life is nothing but death. Oh my. But I'll tell you, the people that are really dead, they're the people who just have Adam's life and are living under the dominion of the, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time. What, now what's the characteristic of all of this? Gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature. That's why people do what they do. That's why people live as they live. And that's why people who come to Christ sometimes outwardly have never really surrendered their hearts and they're really still trying to serve self and they're trying to paper that over with a little bit of religion to salve their conscience. And they never really have anything. And I'll tell you, this is a dangerous time. People need to be in one, all, it's all or nothing. I know uh, Brother Thomas uh, used to preach on, in this area. And I, I remember the title of one of his messages. I'm sure there were others. And the title was simply God or the Devil. How many of you remember that? God or the Devil. That's the choices, folks. If people are not, have not completely given their hearts to him, and, and when partakers of his life, they are living under the dominion of Satan. And they're not going to like it very much on the judgment day. That's a re that is real and that is coming. And the thing is, it, people don't know when it's coming either. Oh my, this is a sober, it's a sober truth. I don't know, I'm, I, the Lord knows what, the, what this is about. But I'm burdened that there's people who could fool themselves. You know, it's like Donald has said, this goes many places, so this word may be for somebody in Kalamazoo for all I know. But I believe it's, I don't believe it's confined to that. My God, there's people who need to just come to a place where they have let go and let God have their life. You know, what do we just sing about? The potter's hand. Potter doesn't, doesn't have his own plans and tell the potter to, or the clay, I'm sorry. Anyway, the, the, the pot doesn't say, hey, I've got my own plans, but I need you to smooth out a few rough places here. Help me fulfill my dreams. Oh, no. 
The picture everywhere is that if we're going to have his life, we're going to have to give up ours. There is no other way. We have no idea. We have no idea how sinful sin is. We have no idea how unlike him we are. Again, all you have to do is look at Isaiah and a few others that saw him, and they, they got it instantly. But, oh my, our life is so different from his. Our motivations as we're born into this world are so desperately different. And what is it that's driving all of this? It's the cravings that we have. God invested in us glorious gifts. His gifts were a capacity for pleasure, a capacity for creativity. I mean, we were made in his image. We were invested with tremendous gifts and talents and abilities and, and capabilities. But what happens when self gets in charge of those? It's, it's hell. There's no other way to put it. It's a destructive thing. It takes people down and destroys them. And here's God in his mercy coming and, and offering us a brand new kind of life. Something that's totally different. Oh my. You know, he doesn't picture this, uh, you know, this exchange of our life for his as being something that, well, we just instantly become you know, full-blown saints. But I'll tell you, there is a fundamental change that happens in the heart. And that's why he goes on and says, they loved not their lives unto the death. There's a willingness day by day by day to let go. God is calling every one of us today to let go of things so that we can have more of his life. But there's a reason, I, I believe I went back to this passage. Let me, let me go ahead, back in, in uh, Ephesians. Here's another one of those wonderful buts. But God, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him where? You see the connection between this and, and uh, Revelation? Seated us in the heavenly realms. There is another realm. There is a spiritual realm. There is a spiritual kingdom. And it's real. People of the world do not see it. Satan has blinded their eyes lest they see that. But oh, folks, we need to be rejoicing this morning. We need to be thankful because we didn't earn this. God reached out to dead people and gave us life seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Why? In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. You know, I, I, it just boggles the mind to even think. You know, the Lord has allowed some people to actually visit heaven. I don't, I don't believe every account, but there's people who have actually been there. And they come back and they talk about how impossible it is to describe. Do you think God is against pleasure? Do you really think God, is a, who invented this, the capabilities we have for pleasure, is against it? What he's against is something that has been turned inward, become selfish, become just all about me. Man, it's like cancer. You think about cancer cells in the body. Man, they're all about community, aren't they? Help the body out. No, they are absolutely 100% selfish. They're all about taking from the body, growing, doing whatever they please. Whatever, whatever damage is done, that's too bad. It's all about me. That's what the life of Adam is in you, no matter how you dress it up. It is a destructive force. And folks, anybody that is caught is enslaved by their natural desires just to live for that, to kind of chase the, the rainbow that's always just a little, a little out there. You can't quite get it, but you can't stop chasing it. Oh, I want to tell you, there's a God who has something better. There's a God who has made us to know him. He made us to live in himself. I don't know how to put this, but he's the, he is the atmosphere, that he is the source of life that we were meant to be animated by. The devil will lie to you and tell you that your highest happiness is to 
pursue your own dreams and do what rises out of your own mind and your own heart or do it your way. But I'll tell you, we serve a God who has such incredible plans for his people. Do you imagine, can you imagine this, for example? That there's somebody that is born with great natural musical talent. It's just something that's born into them. And we, you know, we recognize that people have different gifts and abilities. But can you imagine them going to heaven and, and just God sitting on that and squashing it? Or do you imagine they will be so filled with the glorious life of God that music that we, have, we can't even dream of will flow out of them? Things they've dreamed about. Can you imagine being in a place where there will be no such thing as a wrong desire? Think about that. That's what Jesus died and rose again to give us. That's the life of this kingdom we're talking about. Man, I want, I, I want to get rid of Adam, thank you. He's, he's called me to something. He's given me just a little bit of a glimpse of what he's called us to. Folks, it's incredible. To be so transformed that we are filled with his life instead of our own and we're set free from the tyranny, the slavery to these earthly passions that want to rule over us. Oh, I want to be free, don't you? When the Lord puts his hand on stuff, I want to be able to say, I want to be able to let go and say, oh God, I thank you. This is not stifling me. This is setting me free from something that would own me. You know, Jesus said, he that commits sin, as a practice he's talking about there, it's an ongoing thing. He who commits sin is the servant. There's a lot of folks that would think slavery is a terrible thing, and they're slaves and don't know it. Oh, God, the things that he has set before us. Can you imagine people who are gifted in poetry, gifted in art, gifted in so many ways, so, uh, teachers, uh, you name it. And they're set completely free to be filled with the glory of God and give complete unbridled expression to those abilities forever. You want to live for, for this and die? That's the deception that holds this world in captivity and darkness. And it is just that, the, 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 the opposites there are just that stark. The difference is that stark. There's only two ways. It's either we're going to give up everything and just serve Jesus and be willing in the process to let go of things, or we're going to cling, we're going to find some mechanism, some way of hanging on to our way and our will, and either just pursue that and glory in it, like Paul said in Romans 1, there's people who not only they do the wickedness that they know it brings judgment, they get to the point where they boast about it. They glory in it, and that's, that's where so many in our world are today. Oh, I praise God that he's given us, a, given us a hope where we can have something so much better. I'll tell you what. This is real. This is not just doctrine. When Jesus warned the people. You know, Jesus used similar language, didn't he? He talked about the glories of the kingdom and, and how people had to, anybody that wants to hang on to his life, he's going to lose it. But he who gives his, you know, lay, lays down his life, he'll get to keep it forever. Life eternal. But didn't he look at the religious people and say, woe to you. Woe, woe to you. It was as though you don't have any idea what's coming. It wasn't joy that caused him to do that. It was anguish of heart that caused him to reach out and say, Man, something terrible is coming. Don't you, don't you get it? Don't you know? Don't you understand? This world needs to know. Whoa. You have no idea the power that rules this world. And the only thing I can pray is that God will somehow awaken. Somehow he will awaken those who have a false hope. You know, there's a lot of folks in, in Matthew chapter 7 who, had, who went through a gate expecting to go to heaven. They went through with a big crowd. They all expected to go to heaven. They were busy all their lives serving God. 
doing religious things, building churches, starting missions, doing all kinds of stuff. And they got to the end. Depart from me. You that work iniquity. I never knew you. What was the problem? No, he was never their Lord. They never really laid down self. They never gave it up. They found a way to be religious. They learned the language. They learned the ideas and the behaviors. Oh, God. God's going to make a difference. God's going to bring about a work of separation in this last hour. And I pray, I pray that those who have a false hope, that, that, that God has never been able to pin you down and, and show you what a rotten sinner you are and how desperately you need him. I pray that God will wake you up but while it's time. If you'll stop kidding yourself and thinking you can find another way. But I pray for God's people. I pray that God will make this, make this kingdom that he has given to us so real that we'll be full of that life that he purchased for us. We will, re we will continue to look back to the glory of what we have been given. I didn't earn that blood. I didn't shed it. I didn't, make those, I didn't come up with those promises. All he asks of me is that I let my life go, give it to him, and let him remake it. That's all. A child can do that. And he is faithful. Oh, the hope that he's given to us. Do you see what the issue turns on? It's our life. What are we going to do with it? Whose life is it? Is it really still ours? Are we still got a death grip on part of it? And we're trying to live it and trying to claim ownership of it and trying to somehow make it okay? Well, we just said, Lord, I surrender. Boy, what a difference. A rejoicing for a kingdom. And woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because there's going, to, there's going to come a day when men's hearts will be failing them for fear. We're seeing some of that now. There's going to, be, there's going to come a day when, men, when people will be crying for the rocks to fall on them, the mountains to fall on them. I want his life, don't you? But in this, in the middle of this, I pray that there will be, that life will be so real in us that where there are those that God is dealing with, they'll have something to see. And that gets down to where you and I live right now because one of the characteristics of those people is they loved not their lives unto the death. And I believe God is putting his hand on every one of us. There's not one of us that, even though we've given our hearts to him and he's given his life, we've been born of his spirit, that doesn't have battles that we face every single day. Oh, what a glorious foundation we stand upon. We stand upon something that's already been done. You know, Ben reminded me of something I said in a recent service in the men's meeting this morning about the fact that we are, victory is not something that's out there somewhere. Victory was won back there. And we have but to stand on upon that victory and believe it with all of our hearts and claim it. And the devil knows that he has no answer for that. Whatever the issues in your life are, realize what's going on in the world. God has called a kingdom together. He has laid a foundation and he's calling people out of darkness into light. He's rescuing them from the power of darkness and bringing, translating them, bringing them into the kingdom of the son he loves. But I'll tell you, the people of this world need to hear the warning. Woe. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. That's people who live down here. Their minds are earthly. Their, their interest is earthly. They're, they're controlled by earthly desires. That's their life. They've they got blinders on. God, there's a warning in this hour. It's a late hour. If there's anybody who has any capacity to hear the voice of the Son of God, bow to it. Open your heart and live. He will give you life the moment you say yes from the bottom of your heart. He will do it. 
You know, you feel, sometimes you feel the desires, you, you sense a little bit of his heart in this, and you just wish, oh God, I wish I could do something, and all I can do is just give out, give out his word as best I can. It just feels like such a poor effort, but I'd, God knows it's not, the, it's not the effort. It's whether his spirit works in hearts. You know, one of the emphases this morning in the men's meeting over and over again, I think in the prayer meeting as well, is the fact that God has called us to a warfare for souls. And Christians cannot stand on the sidelines and expect sinners to get saved. They need to be, I mean, there are strongholds of Satan that need to be attacked by God's people. And we can attack them, not by preaching at people, but we can attack them in prayer. We can attack them with a, with a stand in our spirit. There's people right here that, that are in bondage and darkness that don't know it. There's people out there that we know. We have the privilege of, pray, of being his people, living in this kingdom. Which kingdom are you living in? Are we sleeping? Are we sleepwalking through the end of the age? God help us to wake up and, and lay hold of the, the victory that was won at the cross. But not just for us. So we can say, hey, I got it. What about you? We can say, God has put a sword in my hand. I have the ability to fight for somebody else. Jesus fought for me. I was in need. I wasn't looking at him, looking to him. But he came down for my rescue. He laid down his life so I could have life. And he did the same for you. And that's what he calls his people to do. The door is not closed. It's getting late, but the door is not closed. I believe God, with all my heart, God is looking to, to fill a people with his life so that he can demonstrate to the world the reality of his kingdom. And as this society deteriorates, we're going to see opportunities. We're going to see people who come into a place of distress and they realize that this world is not worth living for. And they're going to be looking for something. Where are they going to find it? Where are they going to find it? God help them. I, I want them to find it in me. I want them to see and sense something about me and you that draws them not to us, we're nobody, but that draws them to Jesus Christ. Draws them to the one who won that victory, who was willing to come down and give his life for us. Oh, and I'll tell you, the armies of heaven are engaged in this, and God wants us to be as well. It was kind of a scattered message in a way, but it's a word to, to two categories of people. The people that live in the heavenly realms who have been called there because of Jesus have no other reason to claim it except that they've surrendered their lives to him and, and been born of a different life. That's a life that can grow up and, be, and completely fulfill the purpose for which you and I were created. The life of Adam can never do that. And as long as we cling to that, we are going to perish with this world. So it's a, it's a twofold message. It's glory and it's woe. I have no idea what the title is, Danny. Somebody has a good title, you help me out here. But praise the Lord. As scattered and as crazy as it is, I hope the Lord got in it a little bit. But folks, God help us and wake us up. Every single one of us, whichever category you're in, whichever kingdom you're in, wake us up so that we realize where we're living and what we have in Jesus Christ. We have every reason to rejoice this morning. If you're in him, man, we got, we're on shouting ground. We are on shouting ground because Jesus has paid it all. <laughs> Open heaven's door for helpless, unworthy sinners. I am so glad to take that place. I don't glory in the sin part, but I'm so glad to say, Lord, I don't have a single reason where I can look to me and, and think that I'm anything, that I deserve anything. You did it. I'm glad to pray, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But he is. He is. There's hope for anyone that will hear his voice and turn their hearts to him. So let's give him glory and praise. Praise the Lord.